29-year-old Burley, Idaho native Richard Bendel was beginning to put his life back together. Following a few run-ins with the law and a messy and difficult divorce, Richard was working full-time, living with a girlfriend, and doing his best to take care of his family following the passing of his father. Described as an experienced outdoorsman and accomplished bird hunter, Richard had always found peace and solace out in the wilderness. On a cool Sunday in mid-November of 1996, he decided to head back out into the wild. Borrowing a shotgun, he headed north towards the Great Rift of Idaho. There, he would enter difficult and treacherous terrain, sprawling lava flows, dry desert sands, and overgrowths of sagebrush. Just after sunset, Richard made an emergency call to his mother. He'd run into some trouble with his truck and couldn't get it started. He needed someone to come and get him. He planned to walk down the road and mark it so that his mother could find him more quickly but he never called back and has never been seen again. Richard's truck was found the next morning with a window smashed out and the battery severely damaged. Had Richard truly run into trouble with his truck that night or was something far more sinister responsible for his disappearance? This is Trace Evidence, Episode 206, The Vanishing of Richard Bendel. Welcome to Trace Evidence. I'm your host, Stephen Pacheco. Today, we examine the mysterious disappearance of 29-year-old Richard Bendel. Before getting into the case, just a few quick notes about the show. Trace Evidence is a weekly true crime podcast focused on unsolved murders and disappearances. Visit trace-evidence.com for all social media links, episode breakdowns, donation options, and contact information. You can submit case suggestions through the website or by emailing me directly at traceevidencepod at gmail.com. Richard Bendel headed out for a lazy Sunday afternoon of hiking and hunting, something he had done hundreds of times in the past. However, on this particular occasion, he never made it home, and the mystery surrounding his disappearance has continued to endure for more than two decades. This is episode 206, The Vanishing of Richard Bendel. When Sandra Bendel picked up her ringing telephone that Sunday evening, she had no way of knowing that it was only the beginning of a nightmare which would continue for more than two decades. The call came from her 29-year-old son, Richard, who had gone hunting in the desert north of his hometown of Burley. Richard, an experienced hunter and outdoorsman, had run into vehicle trouble and couldn't get his old pickup started. Requesting a ride home, Richard tried to describe the area to his mother. But considering the vastness of the desert, lava flows, and a series of dirt side roads which could be difficult to discern, it was almost impossible to give accurate directions in darkness. Richard explained to his mother that he was going to walk down the road to where the turn-in was so that he could mark the path for her to find him more easily. He said he would call back when he finished, but another call never came. Worried about the cold weather and the dangerous terrain, Sandra went along with Richard's girlfriend, Cindy, and the two began the long drive north to try and track him down. Unfortunately, along the way, they ran into their own car trouble and had to turn back, filing a missing persons report with the Minidoka County Sheriff's Office. Search efforts kicked off the next morning, with Richard's truck being discovered fairly early on. While investigators had hoped finding the truck would bring them closer to the missing man, instead, they came upon a scene which only added confusion to an already difficult search. One of the truck's windows was smashed out, and the battery was found broken and tipped upside down. Inside the truck were Richard's coat, the shotgun he'd borrowed, and the phone he'd used to call his mother. There was no trace of the missing man anywhere else, and weather had destroyed any tracks he might have left. Searchers and Richard's family found themselves facing the treacherous terrain of the harsh southern Idaho country flooded with basalt ridges, dense sagebrush, lava flows, caves, rifts, and all manner of dangerous animals and pitfalls. After repeated efforts failed to find any trace of the missing man, investigators began wondering if perhaps the reason they couldn't find him was because he wasn't out there at all. Richard Willis Bendel was born on Friday, August 18, 1967 in Burley, Idaho, to parents Thomas and Sandra. 
Richard was Sandra's first and only son, with him coming into the world a year and a half after the birth of his older sister, Sheila. Richard would grow up in Burley, a city straddling the line between both Cassia and Minidoka counties. Located in southern Idaho, Burley is far from the hustle and bustle of big city living, as at the time of Richard's birth, the population was listed at just over 8,000. More than 50 years later, things haven't changed all that much, and even today, Burley's population lingers below 11,000, allowing the city to maintain its reputation as more of a tight-knit community as opposed to the anonymous living in larger cities. Burley is known for holding a semi-arid climate, and historic records denote the harsh contradictions that can occur between winter and summer, showing a record high temperature of 107 and a record low of negative 30. While many people, when imagining Idaho, tend to think of the lush greenery, national forests, and beautiful vistas of the northern portion of the state, especially the Panhandle, the southern border is shared by both Nevada and Utah, where the vastness of dry desert land and thick overgrowths of sagebrush unfold to reveal a tough country, difficult terrain, seemingly endless sand-swept horizons. Burley is seated 30 miles northwest of the City of Rocks National Reserve and Castle Rock State Park, and 45 miles south of the Craters of the Moon National Monument and Preserve. Named due to the topography's resemblance to the surface of the moon, the monument and preserve is located in the Snake River Plain, where it encompasses three major lava fields and approximately 400 square miles of steppe grasslands, combining to spread out for more than 1,117 square miles. All three of the lava fields lie along the Great Rift of Idaho, home to some of the best examples of rift cracks anywhere in the world, including the deepest known on Earth, measuring out at 800 feet. Growing up in a rural area that provided tremendous access to bountiful natural resources, Richard quickly developed an appreciation for the land. As a youth, his father stoked in him an interest in fishing, hunting, camping, hiking, and exploring. Together, Father and son would often head out for the weekend, leaving Burley behind as they traveled up north into the desert to hunt, bond, and to challenge themselves against the elements. Over the years, Richard learned a lot from his father. Becoming highly familiar with the terrain, he could more than take care of himself out in the wilderness. Friends and family referred to him as an experienced outdoorsman who felt at home in the wild, and he was noted as being an accomplished bird hunter. Outside of hunting and camping, Richard has been described by many as an extremely kind-hearted, devoted friend who went out of his way to help others. It wasn't uncommon for Richard to drop everything in order to pitch in when someone needed assistance, whether it was as simple as cleaning the garage or repairing a flat tire. Richard was extremely skilled with his hands, in particular when it came to fixing things. Whether it was working under the hood of a friend's car or fixing up a broken vacuum, he had an innate understanding and ability when it came to repairs, and as a result, became the go-to person for friends and family whenever they ran into a technical issue or they just couldn't get the radio working. In 1980, when Richard turned 13 years old, his mother gave birth to a second daughter, Tamra, completing the family with Richard being the middle child and only boy. Richard was excited for the birth of his sister and really went out of his way to look after and take care of her. According to his mother, he was always there to help out and support his siblings and his parents. She explained that Richard was a, quote, happy-go-lucky guy who had everything going for him. He has always been there for me, my right arm, end quote. Richard would go on to attend Burley High School alongside many of the kids he'd been going to school with locally for years. By his mid-teens, he'd begun filling out growing to a height of 5 feet 11 inches, while his body transformed from slim and lithe to toned and muscular. Growing his thick, wavy hair down to his shoulders, the dark frame of his hairline accentuated those sparking green eyes and a visage supported by a strong jaw and prominent chin. Suffice it to say, Richard's good looks combined with his genuine open personality and kindness made him a popular guy amongst his female classmates, who frequently dropped notes in his locker and beamed smiles as they passed in the hallway. Graduating in 1985, the years following high school are somewhat difficult to nail down. It appears, based upon public records, that Richard remained in the Burley area for the most part, 
working odd jobs and trying to find his footing now an adult in the real world. What exactly Richard was up to for the next five years has been lost to time or obscured via the public record. However, he reemerges in the summer of 1990. In July of that year, just one month before his 23rd birthday, Richard would travel south to Elko, Nevada, where he would marry Katie Boswell in the same city where his own parents had wed. Richard and Katie had been through a lot by the time they said their vows. Five months earlier, in February, the couple suffered the most devastating loss any parents can. Their first child, a boy named Brent, was tragically delivered stillborn. Laid to rest in Burley's Pleasant View Cemetery, Brent was interred beneath the stone reading, Our Baby, Brent James. While for most couples the loss of a child can be the inciting incident which leads to bitter disputes and the dissolution of the relationship, for Richard and Katie, the opposite appeared to be true. Drawn together in their grief, the young couple would go on to have a daughter, born in 1991, and a son a year later in 92. However, while Richard's family was beginning to come together, the rest of his life was on the verge of collapse. While not much has ever been said about Richard's habits or lifestyle up until the time of his marriage, one thing we know for certain is that the early 90s were a difficult and tumultuous time not only for Richard, but for those who loved him. It all appeared to begin in November of 1990, when Richard ran afoul of the law and was ticketed for speeding, a backing violation, and operating a vehicle without insurance. His traffic infractions, while frustrating and financially difficult, would be the least of his worries, however, as in August of 1991, he was arrested in a drug sting which saw him charged in Minidoka County with two counts of marijuana delivery. He was also hit with drug trafficking charges in Cassia County, connected to the previously mentioned delivery charges. In December of 1991, Richard signed a deal with prosecutors and entered guilty pleas for his marijuana delivery charges. According to the South Idaho Press, he was given a suspended sentence and placed on probation under special conditions requiring that he pay court costs, pay monthly supervision fees while on probation, make restitution to the county for his use of a public defender, and make restitution to the Idaho Bureau of Narcotics. He was required to serve 120 days of home detention, participate in a rehab program, receive approvals for any expenditures over $250, obtain alcohol and drug evaluations, and submit to random blood, breath, or urine tests. He was also barred from consuming alcohol or any drugs outside of prescriptions. He was not allowed to enter an establishment where alcohol was the major source of income, and he had to either maintain steady employment or become a full-time student. Three years later, in April of 94, Tragedy struck the Bendel family when Richard's father, Thomas, passed away following a sudden illness. He was just 52 years old. The loss was absolutely devastating to the family, who had always looked upon Thomas as their rock. The strong, sharp-minded leader of the family, who seemed to know how to fix whatever problems might come up. Richard was 26 when his father passed away, with his younger sister being just 14. He stepped up during a time of overwhelming grief took it upon himself to try and fill the void left by his father, spending more time around his family, and doing his best to help them out while also trying to overcome his own demons. Four months later, in August, Richard was officially discharged from probation and was well on his way to recovery, working hard to keep drugs and alcohol out of his life. Unfortunately, following the loss of his father and the struggle to figure out where to go next, Richard's marriage began hitting the rocks. Not much has ever been revealed about Richard's wife nor the nature of their relationship. However, Idaho public records show that on Monday, September 25th, 1995, Katie officially filed for divorce. According to friends and family, the divorce was far from amicable, with many describing it as messy and vicious. During the process, Katie took custody of the children and they lived with her in Rupert, 10 miles northeast of Burley. While Richard managed to keep himself out of trouble for the most part following his probation release, he would soon trip up a time or two. Just two days after the divorce was filed, Richard was ticketed for driving without insurance and for not wearing a seatbelt. Six days later, on Tuesday, October 3rd, he was charged with driving under the influence. 
15 days later, he was ticketed for speeding. And two months later, on Wednesday, December 6th, he was once again pulled over and arrested for driving under the influence. While these were obviously painful steps backward for Richard, they did seem to shake him out of his stupor, as beginning in January of 1996, he kept himself clean and steered clear of crossing the wrong side of the law. January of 1996 was not just a turning point in Richard's life as pertained to getting clean, but also in regard to his love life. He'd go on to begin a relationship with Cindy Cowitz, moving in with a single mother and her children. According to Cindy, the couple developed a strong bond and their relationship was happy and a loving one, with the two spending as much of their free time together as they could. Richard picked up work as a supervisor at the J.R. Simplot Company, which specialized in potato products. The plant was located in the city of Hayburn, less than five miles northeast of downtown Burley. It was a good job, and Richard took to it easily, enjoying what he was doing and the people he worked with, who would go on to describe him as polite, funny, and always willing to lend a hand. 1996 would, in a sense, be a banner year for Richard as he put the pieces back together and got his life back on track. While the divorce was difficult, Richard was in a good place dating Cindy, working a job he liked, and spending time with his family and friends. It could have been the start of a new beginning for the Burley native, but as always seemed to be the case for Richard, something darker was awaiting just over the horizon. Three months after celebrating his 29th birthday, Richard Bendel would mysteriously vanish after a strange and disturbing phone call. On the morning of Sunday, November 17th, Richard made the short drive across town, stopping at his mother's home on Brentwood Avenue. Arriving in his blue 1984 Chevrolet pickup truck, Richard told his mother that he was planning to head up north to hunt for a little while in the areas where him and his father used to go. Richard then borrowed his father's shotgun, which he had done on many occasions in the past, and told his mother that he was going to do a little pheasant hunting. According to Sandra, everything seemed fine as she explained to the Times News, saying, quote, He seemed quite happy that day, and we had a little chit-chat before he left. End quote. Richard drove away from his mother's home that afternoon, heading north towards the Great Rift, approximately 45 miles north of Burley. The desert area, frequently noted as lava-encrusted, presents challenging terrain and is home to hundreds of caves, lava rocks, ice tubes, and scoria cones. It is a rough and difficult terrain, much of which is accessible only via dirt roads, which are little more than dirt and rock trails, which can be difficult to navigate under even the best of circumstances. The vast spread of the desert and a lack of easily noted landmarks can lead to even the most experienced outdoorsmen becoming disoriented and getting lost. One experienced hunter and hiker familiar with this area referred to it as difficult to traverse and easy to get lost in, especially without proper navigational aids. Richard had hunted in this area many times in the past, both with and without his father, and was highly familiar with it, at least in terms of accessing the desert. However, once he began making his way along the dirt roads, traversing through the unforgiving terrain, it didn't take long for a few turns here and there to result in the 29-year-old finding himself in an unfamiliar spot somewhere out there. According to records of the time, the sun set at approximately 5.11 p.m., and without the light and warmth it provided, the desert became pitch dark with temperatures dropping to just 28 degrees 30 minutes later. According to Sandra, she received a call from Richard at approximately 6 p.m. The family owned an old-school bag cell phone, which could operate only when it was plugged into a vehicle's cigarette lighter and Richard had taken it along with him, as was normal whenever a family member was going somewhere where they could run into trouble. It was for emergencies, and as such, when Richard called his mother that night, he had to do so collect. Apparently, Richard was having some kind of an issue with his truck and needed someone to come and get him. Sandra explained, quote, He said his pickup had broken down. It had a quarter tank of gas, but it wouldn't start. He said he was going to try and mark the road, and then he was going to try and call me back. End quote. According to Sandra, even though Richard knew the area, he wasn't able to give exact directions to his location, and so, hoping to make it easier to find him, 
He planned to walk down to the end of the road where the turnoff was and somehow mark it. What happened next, however, no one is quite sure. But what we do know is Richard never called his mother back that night. After waiting a while to hear back from Richard and never getting the call, Sandra got in touch with his girlfriend, Cindy. The two women decided to go looking for him together, with Cindy dropping by to pick up Sandra in her van. It would be a difficult drive, but Cindy was more familiar with the area than Sandra, and so the two hoped it wouldn't take them long to track him down. Unfortunately, however, they would never come close to Richard or his truck. As they neared the desert and the roads became less forgiving, Cindy struck an object which severely damaged the oil pan of her van, requiring them to turn around and head back to Burley. As a result, around 2 a.m., approximately eight hours since Richard had called for assistance, his mother contacted the Minidoka County Sheriff's Office and filed a missing persons report, giving all of the pertinent information she had about his location in the desert. Not long after filing the report, Temperatures dropped below 20 degrees, and it began snowing. Six inches would accumulate overnight, obscuring the dirt roads of the desert and covering over any details which may have made it easier to find where exactly Richard had gone. Considering the challenge of the terrain and how dangerous it could be to begin a search in the sprawling darkness, the decision was made that search efforts for Richard would begin on the morning of Monday, November 18th, approximately 13 hours after he had called for help. The initial search focused in on an area in which they believed Richard was most likely to be, described as somewhere near Kimama Butte, 20 miles northwest of Burley and southwest of the Craters of the Moon. Considering the proximity to neighboring Blaine County, the Minidoka County Sheriff's Office called an assistance of search and rescue teams from both Blaine and Lincoln counties. Weather worked to hamper the search, as constant rain transformed the dirt roads into thick, muddy pathways and overcast skies threatening storms grounded a search plane which was to be utilized early on. While a large-scale search of the area failed to turn up any trace of Richard or where he might be, law enforcement did find his truck. The blue pickup was located approximately two miles northwest of the Kari Kimama Crossing, which would place the vehicle close to an area known as Laidlaw Corrals. This would also move jurisdiction for the search out of Minidoka and into neighboring Blaine County. On the morning of Tuesday, November 19th, Minidoka Sheriff Paul Freeze officially handed the case over, telling the media that they would continue to assist in the search, but had had difficulties accessing the desert from the Minidoka side. He explained, quote, We will help on this end, as the sheriff in Blaine County was us to. The desert has become so bad that it's difficult to get in from this side. End quote. Details regarding the condition of Richard's truck when found by investigators have been issued rarely, but what has been revealed paints a confusing and bizarre picture. Searchers came across a turnout where they found empty cardboard case of beer surrounded by cans. Considering that Richard had told his mother he was going to mark the road he was on, searchers believe this was likely his marker, utilizing items that he had with him at the time. Moving down the road, they quickly came upon the blue pickup and immediately noted that one of the windows had been smashed and there was glass all around. Inside of the truck, investigators found the cell phone Richard had used, along with his coat and his father's shotgun. What make, model, or gauge the shotgun was, whether it was loaded, and if so, with what shells has never been revealed. It has also never been stated whether or not the gun had been recently fired, where any expended shells found, and where exactly in the vehicle the gun was located. The discovery of the gun was a disturbing detail for Sandra, who knew how much her husband's memory had meant to Richard, as she told the Times News, quote, he would never have left his dad's shotgun, end quote. The strange situation regarding the truck didn't end there, though. The most prominently reported detail, which also happens to be one of the more confounding, was the condition of the battery. Official reports state that the battery was broken and found, quote, tipped upside down. Unfortunately, there's never been any clarity given to this statement, leading many to question whether the battery was found upside down on the ground or if it had been forcibly placed upside down in its usual spot beneath the hood. 
There have been a lot of different theories about why the battery was found in this condition, though none of them have ever been supported by solid facts or evidence, and so it remains another facet of this case that cannot be properly answered. Since the truck wouldn't start without a battery, law enforcement had the vehicle towed back to Burley where it would be checked for evidence while searches for Richard continued. Unfortunately, in the more than 25 years that have passed, no additional information about the truck or any evidence found has been released. There appears to be somewhat of a debate about how exactly the truck was handled after being found as well, with Cindy noting that neither she nor Sandra were notified of the vehicle's discovery. Instead, law enforcement first notified Credit Auto Sales, who carried the loan for the vehicle, and according to the family, Richard was up to date on his payments. Cindy later told the Times News, quote, They knew where the truck was, and it seemed they didn't want to tell us. I want to go back out and search, but I don't know where to start anymore. End quote. Searches throughout Tuesday the 19th were again hampered by weather as heavy rains battered the area. Ground searchers were moving through a lot of difficult terrain made muddy and slippery by the weather, while tracking dogs struggled to get a scent. The search plane, which had been partially utilized Monday but was grounded due to weather, was not able to take to the skies on Tuesday either. Asked about the status of the search, Sheriff Paul Fries explained, quote, If he would have stayed on the roads, he would have been located by now, but it all depends on the weather. Hypothermia sets in, in a matter of hours, and the longer anyone is out there, the less likely they are to survive unless they have extensive survival skills. End quote. Hypothermia was always a risk in the desert, especially during the cold months. But when you factor in that Richard left his coat behind in the truck, many wondered if perhaps he'd become disoriented from the cold and lost his way after marking the turnout and trying to get back to the truck. Why he wouldn't have taken his coat in the first place, let alone the shotgun, are again questions which have never been appropriately answered. Three tracking dogs joined the search midway through Tuesday, and Richard's employer, J.R. Simplot, provided a helicopter to assist. While the more time passed, the more dangerous of a situation it became for the missing man, searchers remained hopeful that they could find him alive, noting that they'd rescued lost people in the area as many as five days after they'd last been seen. Blaine County Sheriff Walt Femling noted, quote, We're going to make as big a push as we can. We are still optimistic. End quote. Wednesday, November 20th, was the third day of searching and perhaps one of the biggest. Law enforcement from three counties were joined by several search and rescue teams, local volunteers, searchers on foot, horseback, and all-terrain vehicles. The search plane managed to get in the air that day, as did the helicopter. Unfortunately, no traces of Richard could be located, and by the time evening fell on Wednesday, they really didn't have much of an idea where the missing man could be. He might have holed up in a cave to avoid the weather, or perhaps crawled into a rift for warmth. But had he become stuck or unable to get out, the chances of finding him were severely limited. At the close of the day, the decision was made that searchers would be pulled out of the area in order to allow several teams of tracking dogs to work it over. Between the bad weather, winds, and all of the scents associated with a large search party, Investigators believe the dogs had a better chance of tracking Richard were they to be deployed with the least amount of distractions possible. Captain Jane Ramsey would later tell the Times News that they would exhaust all search options before they ever considered calling off the expeditions. By Thursday, the 21st, search efforts for Richard had ramped down somewhat. Many of the volunteers were unable to continue taking time away from work and their lives, more than 35 people had been involved in the previous day's searching, but by Thursday, there were only a pair of search dogs and four of their handlers combing the area. Greg Sage, a lieutenant with the Blaine County Sheriff's Office, explained that they hadn't given up, telling the Times News, quote, if the dog teams come up with any clues, we'll redeploy the search team, end quote. Around this time, rumors began circulating throughout the area about what may have happened to Richard. While the vast majority believed that the 29-year-old was simply lost somewhere in the wilderness, certain rumors suggested that he may have been the victim of a crime, perhaps by someone he may have met in the area, or even someone who could have gone along with him, 
as investigators could not determine if he had been alone on this hunting trip. Beyond those theories, there were even suggestions that perhaps Richard had faked his own disappearance in order to get away for one reason or another. His family quickly dismissed the latter thought, however, with his mother Sandra saying, quote, I thought it was tough losing my husband, but this is a lot tougher. He didn't have any money or clothes, and he doesn't even get paid until Friday. He wouldn't do this to me. End quote. Sandra was not the only member of the family struggling to accept the harshness of this new reality. Richard's younger sister, Tamara, also spoke to the media and explained how difficult it was, saying, quote, We were really close after we lost my dad. He was always there, and he reminded me of my dad. And now it feels like I'm losing my dad again. End quote. Asked her thoughts about the missing man, his girlfriend, Cindy, theorized that he had to be somewhere near that truck, saying, quote, My guess is that he's somewhere back in the lava rocks. That's the only place where he could have gone into without a trace and the lava rock go on forever. It's all around the place where they found his pickup, end quote. Over the weekend of the 23rd and 24th, Blaine County officials returned to the search area, bringing four teams of tracking dogs out to the unforgiving landscape. The hope was that they could pick up on Richard's scent or perhaps lead them to some new clue which might indicate what direction he had gone, if nothing else. Unfortunately, that weekend's efforts were much like previous attempts, with nothing being found to bring law enforcement any closer to Richard. Monday, November 25th, marked eight days that Richard had been missing and seven straight days of searching. However, this day would be different from the rest, as they would finally find some items believed to have belonged to Richard, though what the manner of their discovery implied as far as a darker reality was something his family was not eager to find out. Just south from where Richard's truck had been located, searchers came across a black Reebok shoe, which Cindy later identified as belonging to Richard, noting that he had just recently purchased them. A little further south, they found a shoulder-length J.R. Simplot glove, which Richard would have worn when working at the plant in Hayburn. Not much further south, they found a leather glove, which was slightly torn. According to Sheriff Femling, the three items had been found spread out over four miles along Cary Kimama Road. It was noted that the leather glove found most south was actually in Minidoka County, while the rest of the items were in Blaine. The road had previously been extensively searched, though Sheriff Femling noted he wasn't surprised that searchers had missed them in previous searches, telling the Times News, quote, it's sagebrush and it was five feet off the road, so it could have been missed before, end quote. Strangely, following the discovery of these items, the first pieces of evidence in the case since the truck was located, the search for Richard was officially called off. Sheriff Femling explained, quote, unless we get any more information or additional clues, the search is off. There's nothing more we can do. We had over 25 people that searched this weekend with the use of three and four wheel ATVs, as well as regular ground search teams. Besides the shoe, which is the same brand and size he was wearing, and the gloves, there was nothing else found. No footprints, nothing. We covered an area that extended 15 miles wide by 7 miles deep, and that includes the area of deep lava flows. There are lava flows everywhere around there that require extensive searching. We really searched the area, and we used a helicopter again. So, we've done just about all we can. End quote. Around this point in time, law enforcement began making references to the possibility that maybe Richard wasn't out there lost somewhere. Both Minidoka and Blaine counties began their own investigations into Richard's background, financial records, and circle of friends and associates. Asked by the South Idaho Press whether they were considering the possibility of foul play, Sheriff Femling explained that he had his own theories, but he couldn't discuss them publicly. He also specified that this change of direction was part of their protocol, not necessarily an indication of what they believe. Asked if there would be any additional searching, Femling replied, quote, We haven't dropped it all together, but we need something else to go on. We will look at all aspects. 
end quote. Asked his thoughts about closing up the search efforts, at least for the time being, Minidoka County Sheriff Paul Fries expressed his belief that they had really exhausted their efforts on the ground, saying, quote, I have nothing to lead me to a conclusion one way or another. His chances of being lost out there for this amount of time and surviving aren't very good. There's been a terrific effort made by people for search and rescue and the sheriff's departments involved, and I feel pretty confident that they've done just about all they could. End quote. Learning that the search was being called off was another devastating blow to Sandra, Cindy, and everyone who knew and loved Richard. It was also around this time that rumors began going around that investigators knew something more about this case, something that actually led them to believe that Richard may not have ended lost in the wilderness. Whether this was a piece of evidence they never disclosed, information given by an informant, or something else, we have no way of knowing. Cindy, however, felt strongly that investigators were keeping certain details about the case under wraps. She told the South Idaho Press, quote, I've talked to them. It just seems they know more than what they really say. I guess it's nobody's fault. Sometimes you just want to blame everybody. It's just not knowing that makes it so hard. We don't know if he's still out there in the desert or what. Thanksgiving was really hard. It was a bad day. I knew something wasn't right when they found the pickup. End quote. In early December, it was revealed that Blaine County had spent approximately $20,000 in their search efforts, focused in primarily around the area in which the truck had been found. Adding to the confusion in regard to rumors about Richard not being in the desert, Jane Ramsey of the Blaine County Sheriff's Office told the Times News, quote, We have done an air, ground, and dog search in the areas of Blaine County where he disappeared, and they haven't revealed anything. So we feel reasonably confident he isn't in Blaine County, and we're following other leads to his disappearance. End quote. Considering the possibility that Richard could be alive out there somewhere, law enforcement entered his information into a national database, flagging him as a missing person. So should he encounter police anywhere else in the country, they would know he was being looked for. Cassia County Sheriff Billy Crystal expanded on this possibility, saying, quote, We don't know what happened to him yet. But we are following some leads and looking into the possibility that he may have disappeared voluntarily. But we can't ever assume anything until we find out for sure what happened. End quote. Again, Richard's family firmly disagreed with the possibility that he would have just left without saying anything, abandoning them just a year and a half after the death of his father. Tamra, 16 at the time, shot down the suggestion, saying, quote, he had no reason to leave and wouldn't put our family through that. If he was staging it, he would have taken some clothes and some money. End quote. For the most part, the investigation into Richard's disappearance grew stagnant, then cold in the weeks and months after search efforts were called off. In fact, there are no details revealed by investigators, no statements issued to the media, nothing that even mentions Richard or the search for him. In June of 2002, Richard's estranged wife, Katie, filed to have him legally declared deceased. After a series of hearings involving Sandra and members of law enforcement, the order was passed, and Richard was legally declared dead on Friday, October 18th. This was a bitter pill for his family to swallow as to this day. They continue to believe there is more to this story. In February of 2021, the Times News issued a special featured article detailing Richard's disappearance and the efforts to try and locate him. A few new details were revealed in interviews with both Sandra and Cindy. According to Sandra, when Richard called her that night about his truck being broken down, he didn't sound normal, but perhaps frightened. She explained, quote, he was uneasy. He thought someone else was out there and had messed with his truck, end quote. Sandra also revealed that law enforcement had told her that tracking dogs did manage to pick up Richard's scent, but lost it along the roadside, leading them to believe that he may have gotten into a vehicle with someone. Cindy noted that Richard's job paid him through direct deposit and that, in all the years that have passed, his accounts have never been touched, nor has his social security number been used anywhere. Beyond that, all of his belongings, including his clothes, 
were left behind in the apartment they shared together. Cindy stated, quote, He was the man of the house for his mother and for his little sister, Tamara, after his dad died. He took care of them. If he'd just taken off, why were all of his things still there? End quote. Asked about the possibility of foul play, no one in the family seemed to have anyone in mind who may have wanted to harm Richard. However, Cindy mentioned that, given his past issues with drugs and alcohol, he may have still maintained relationships with some of those people. A lot of local rumors revolve around Richard perhaps giving information to investigators or possessing information about an illegal activity which may have made someone want to silence him. As is always the case, however, there have never been any pieces of evidence or solid facts presented to solidify these theories as anything more than general speculation. For Cindy, even after all this time, the wounds are still fresh. She tried to move on with her life after Richard's disappearance, but it appeared there was no one who could fill the void left in his absence. She explained, quote, I believe Rick was my soulmate. I was never with anyone where I had the kind of bond I had with him. I'm still taking it day by day because there was no closure. It still feels like it just happened yesterday. End quote. In 2014, Blaine County authorities approached Sandra and requested a DNA sample so they could make comparisons to any unidentified remains that might be found in the wilderness or surrounding areas. Sandra provided them with a sample, as well as obtaining Richard's dental records for investigators who already possessed his fingerprints. Frustratingly, it was also revealed that sometime around 2010, when the Sheriff's Department moved locations, the original case reports were lost. According to the Sheriff's Department, investigators have worked hard to rebuild as much of the case file as possible, but certainly some information is unlikely to be recovered. Sadly, this is where the case remains today. In more than two decades' time, no new information has ever come to the surface. There have been no persons of interest named, official theories revealed, or any additional information about the evidence, whether it has been retested, whether new technology has been applied to the truck, the gloves, the shoe, or any of the items found inside of the truck. While next month will mark 26 years since Richard was last seen, Almost nothing is known about what may have happened, whether he found himself lost and disoriented in the wilderness and succumbed to the elements, or perhaps if someone else holds the answers. When last seen, Richard Willis Bendel was described as being a white male with brown hair and green eyes, standing 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighing 170 pounds. Richard was wearing brand new black Reebok tennis shoes, one of which was recovered near the location of his truck. Richard was in good shape physically, had hunted in the area many times before, and is described as an experienced outdoorsman. Richard was last seen in Burley, Idaho on the afternoon of Sunday, November 17th. His truck was found near the Laidlaw Corral area in rural Blaine County, not far from the Cary Kimama Crossing. At the time of his disappearance, Richard was 29 years old, and if alive today, he would have turned 55 this August, just a few years older than his mother was the last time she saw him. For nearly 26 years, Richard's family, friends, and loved ones have wondered what became of the kind, helpful, and loving brother, father, and son. It seems, regardless of the passage of time, the answers to this haunting mystery continue to evade discovery. For all of these years, Richard's mother has fought for someone, anyone, to do what is necessary to bring her son home, even if it means having to lie him to rest beside his father. Asked her thoughts after all these years, Sandra replied, quote, You wait, and you wait, and you cry. I still have a hole. I would just like to know what happened before I'm no longer here. I would like for him to be found, either dead or alive, just so I know. Why can't they find my son? At first glance, the disappearance of Richard Bendel sounds like a story we've all heard before. A lone hunter goes off into a harsh and unforgiving environment, becomes disoriented and gets lost somewhere out there in a seemingly endless spread of desolate and challenging land. 
Regardless of someone's level of skill or expertise as an outdoorsman, hunter, or even a survivalist, the dangers of being out alone in the untamed wild are immeasurable. Safety precautions can be taken, tools and supplies necessary for survival, should the worst occur, can prolong the missing person's ability to endure, but the chances of surviving out there on your own are severely limited. Factor in the brutally cold weather and the likelihood of hypothermia setting in becomes higher with each passing hour. However, things are not always as they appear, and this is a case where there's a lot of poignant questions which have never been answered. Oftentimes, when someone is lost out in the wilderness, law enforcement are quick to deploy search teams, and if nothing is found, it becomes a game of numbers. How long could someone survive given what we know about the conditions, the locations, and any supplies they might have brought? How far could someone wander away from a location over a certain amount of time, dictating how wide the search should be? Usually, when search efforts fail to lead them closer to the missing person, law enforcement takes a stance that without further evidence or information, they have to pull back. Budgeting, volunteer availability, and ease of access to the terrain play a large role in how long a search lasts and how large of an area is covered. In cases previously covered on trace evidence, where someone's lost in the wilderness, Investigators often take the position that while they couldn't locate the victim, that doesn't mean they aren't still out there. It's a logical approach, and more often than not, the most difficult questions have simple answers. It's like the old saying goes, when you hear hooves, think horses, not zebras. However, Richard's case is a little different. We're fairly limited on what we actually know about this investigation. For reasons beyond my ability to comprehend over the course of the last 25 years, very little has been revealed about what police may have known or what they may have learned during the searches and the months and years after. However, what adds another level to this investigation is the stance that police took after the discovery of the gloves and shoe. From that moment on, they began making suggestions that they no longer believed Richard was out in the Idaho desert. Some of them even hinted at the possibility that he may have been a victim of foul play rather than someone who got lost. So, Let's begin with the likelihood that Richard did become lost out there and make our way towards the other less supported theories. I think it goes without saying that any time you go out into the wilderness on your own, you take your life into your hands. Whether it's hunting or hiking, a new or familiar location, you never know what's going to happen. The same path you've walked hundreds of times in the past might lead to a broken leg or a twisted ankle. The same campsite you've used countless times might have recently become home to a dangerous animal or your own body could give out on you due to weather, injury, or illness. We know that Richard used to go to this area to hunt with his father, although we don't have an exact timetable for the last time he'd been out there. While it's easy to assume he would have known the area well, we're talking about an expanse of land that sees dramatic shifts in topography over more than 1,000 square miles. An exact time that Richard left his mother's home that Sunday has never been given, but we know that his call for help came at approximately 6 p.m., just shy of an hour after the sunset. According to Sandra, he'd gone out there to go pheasant hunting and had borrowed his father's shotgun, something he had done in the past. Now, I'm no hunter, so to say that I lacked the knowledge or expertise to judge what was going on here might be an understatement. However, in researching this case, the question I've come across most frequently has to do with why Richard was in the desert that day. Many people have said it didn't make sense that he was hunting pheasant, considering the time he was there. Lacking the full knowledge, I don't necessarily disagree with them. However, I did find multiple hunting articles and sites which, in their recommendations, noted the hour before sunset as one of the best times to hunt pheasant, as they will be moving out of heavy cover and into more open roost sites. At the same time, many have pointed out that hunting pheasant without a dog could be extremely challenging, but others who have hunted without a dog since their youth have noted that if you were brought up that way, it really doesn't make much of a difference to you. Now, we might have more information about what was going on in the desert that day were investigators to give more details about the evidence recovered. Knowing whether the shotgun was loaded, if there were shells in the vehicle, or expended shells nearby could help determine whether or not Richard was actually out there hunting that afternoon. There have been no reports about whether or not any felled pheasants were found in the back of the truck, nearby to the scene, anything to suggest Richard might have gotten one or two. We'll get more into the question about why Richard may have gone to the desert later in another theory. 
So assuming he did go out there to hunt, it seems like he wasn't prepared to be out there for an extended period of time. Neither his girlfriend nor his mother were aware of any supplies he may have brought with him should he find himself stuck. It sounds like he didn't consider the possibility and headed out somewhere recklessly, as familiarity and comfort can often lead to such decisions. On the one hand, it sounds like he was going somewhere he had been before and knew well, but when he called his mother, he couldn't give her exact directions, leading many to wonder if maybe he'd wandered a little too far and found himself in a spot he'd never been to before. At 6 p.m., Sandra receives the call, and Richard explains that his truck won't start. When investigators arrive on the scene, they find a window smashed and the battery broken and tipped upside down. While some have speculated that the damaged battery may have been an indication that someone was tampering with the vehicle, others have suggested that perhaps Richard had gone to check it himself and accidentally dropped or damaged it while trying to get the truck running. Remember, this is a guy who's skilled with repair and is familiar with working on vehicles. Surely it's possible he tried to get it going and messed up, although people who knew him well doubted this. In the call, Richard told his mother he was going to mark off the road he'd turned on to to try and make it easier for her to locate him. When investigators found the spot, they said it had been marked by an empty case of beer and several cans. This would mean Richard used what supplies he had with him to mark that location, but it also opens another door. In the past, Richard had run-ins with the law in regard to alcohol, leading many to wonder if he had been drinking out in the desert that night. If indeed he was, that can factor into his decision-making, sense of direction, physical abilities, and the onset of hypothermia. While the act of consuming alcohol can make you feel warmer, the vasodilation caused by alcohol actually makes the body lose heat faster. So now you have to ask yourself, what condition was Richard in when he found himself stuck in the desert that night? Had he just drank a few beers over the course of a couple of hours, or had he drank enough to be buzzed or even drunk? These are questions we don't have the answers to, although while Sandra says Richard sounded frightened on the phone, she didn't make any comments about him sounding drunk or otherwise in an altered state of mind. At this point, it somewhat becomes anyone's guess as to what may have occurred. If Richard decided to walk away from the truck believing he was heading towards a major road or any signs of civilization, he could have gone any number of ways due to disorientation, fear, or confusion. I think it's fairly safe to say that if Richard did walk away from the truck that night, leaving behind his coat and shotgun, there are a myriad of locations in that area where someone could fall in, seek shelter, or become lost where locating them would be almost impossible. Surely, Richard may have gotten himself lost and could still be out there somewhere waiting for someone to stumble upon his remains. However, many people believe something else happened that night. If Richard didn't walk away from his truck willingly, then maybe someone out there might have the answers. Investigators are somewhat dismissive of the idea that someone happened upon Richard that night randomly in the middle of the desert in November. Not a lot of people driving around those poorly carved out hard to navigate dirt roads in the middle of the night. Not to mention, it started snowing that night and by morning it was raining, so overnight, the roads became little more than muddy bogs most vehicles would have to sludge through slowly to avoid sliding off or getting stuck. The most common theory is that, after calling his mother, Richard may have called someone else. Perhaps someone he knew who knew the area better. Maybe someone who had been up there with him before. We might know more if it were revealed whether or not investigators could determine any other calls made from the phone that night, but like so much of this case, we really don't know what was learned from the phone or its records, if anything at all. I suppose, of course, the most rational question is, if Richard called someone for help, someone who had a reason to want to harm him, why would they drive all the way out there to do something to him when they could just as easily have ignored his call for help and allowed the elements to get at him? Beyond that, you have to wonder, why would he have ever called someone for help who may have wanted to harm him? This leads us towards one of the scenarios, which has been frequently suggested as a possibility here. What if Richard didn't go into the desert alone that afternoon? While some believe he may have had a passenger with him, perhaps someone who was trying to lead him into a trap, others have considered that Richard may have planned to meet someone there. Maybe a friend he'd hunted with in the past, maybe someone new in his life, or perhaps someone he simply thought was a friend. I suppose the issue becomes... 
if he had a passenger with him that afternoon, where did they go? They obviously couldn't have driven out with the truck damaged as it was. This would imply someone else had to have been there or was contacted and called out there to pick up this mystery friend slash passenger slash possible assailant. No matter what way you slice it, this would be a really complicated and overly involved way to try and get rid of someone. It would also draw a lot of attention onto the people involved, especially if they were spotted anywhere near that area or Richard in the hours leading up to or following his disappearance. I also think it's worth noting that, according to Sandra, Richard sounded worried and wondered if perhaps someone had tampered with his truck. On the one hand, people have taken this to an extreme and extrapolated from it that Richard may have had someone he was concerned about, or someone in particular he felt who might have wanted to sabotage his truck. But if so, that's never come to the surface. Given the broken window and the damaged battery, some have also wondered if maybe the answer here is less sinister than stupid, for lack of a better term. There's been a theory that another hunter, angry at seeing Richard in his area, may have broken the window in order to pop the hood in order to mess with the battery while Richard was off hunting. Others have considered that a teenager or someone else may have seen the truck and began messing with it, assuming it was abandoned, and then fled the area when they heard Richard approaching. Sadly, it's entirely possible this whole situation was a mistake and the person responsible never considered the lethal consequences of their actions and, as we've seen in many cases, have simply chosen to never come forward. The idea of a straight-up abduction just doesn't make any sense to me or pretty much anyone who worked on this case. Richard was a big guy in great shape with a shotgun in the middle of nowhere. I don't know about you, but to me, that's one of the least likely people I would target for a robbery or abduction. I tend to side with a lot of theorists who believe that if someone else was involved in Richard's disappearance that night, it was more than likely someone he knew. This takes us down a bit of a darker path. According to Richard's family, his drug and alcohol problems were behind him by this point in his life. However, if indeed the beer was what he used to mark the turnoff where his truck had been broken down, then it seems likely he brought beer with him unless, on the extremely off chance, he just happened to keep empty beer cases and cans in his truck. Unlikely, but not entirely impossible, some people never clean their cars out at all. Either way, if Richard did slip, whether it was alcohol or something else, that could play a major factor in his disappearance. While there has never been anything presented that gives any factual basis for the theory, many have wondered if drugs were involved somehow. Apparently, in this particular area around this time, meth was becoming a big thing. I don't look to impugn Richard's name or reputation with baseless accusations, but I do think it's worth considering. While some think Richard may have been using drugs in the desert that night and may have selected to go out there with the plan of drinking and getting high in an area where he knew he was unlikely to run into trouble, others have suggested that perhaps Richard had knowledge of some of his old drug contacts and may have given information to authorities that later led to arrests, making someone want revenge. Again, we don't have anything solid to base these theories on, but since they are a part of the rumor mill circulating around this case, it would be foolish to ignore them. I also think it's worth noting that Idaho court records show two DUI charges in the year prior to Richard's disappearance, suggesting that while he may have gotten away from drugs, alcohol was still involved in his life. If indeed Richard was drunk, high, or using any illicit substances that night, it wouldn't be difficult to imagine that getting lost would have been easier under those conditions. Finally, there are those that believe Richard either staged his own disappearance in an effort to escape for reasons, or he may have gone out into the desert with the plan to take his own life. No one in his family or circle of friends believes Richard would have done either of those things, knowing how devastated his family was by the loss of his father. At the same time, we can't see into someone else's mind, and sometimes people give no warnings or indications about what they're planning to do. Again, we don't have evidence to support either of these theories, but they're worth considering. I don't think Richard would have staged his disappearance in this manner. It seems rather contrived, and at the end of the day, if you were planning to disappear, why would you go out of your way to call your mother and give her your approximate location? Kind of a strange thing to do if you don't want to be found. At the same time, 
Some have pointed out that it's odd that after calling his mother, Richard apparently didn't reach out to anyone else. He didn't call the police, the sheriff's department, or even fish and wildlife management. People who would know the area and might actually have been able to track him down more quickly were never called. At the same time, we don't know if this is because he chose not to call them or because the phone did not work again. Remember, he had to call his mother collect the first time. In addition to this, it seems somewhat strange that when the truck was found, the battery was destroyed. But that battery would have been necessary for the cell phone to work via the cigarette lighter, so the call would have had to have been made before the battery was destroyed. Richard didn't tell his mother anything about a window being smashed out either, so you have to ask, was the truck messed with before Richard disappeared or after? To this day, many people believe the truck was moved from its original spot and left where it was found to throw investigators off. Would that mean that the shoe and gloves found south of that location were dropped by Richard as hypothermia set in, or that someone else tossed them off the side of the road after attacking the 29-year-old. Frustratingly, we are left in the dark on this case. The investigation doesn't appear to have ever revealed much, at least not that's ever been shared. The family, nearly 26 years later, still don't have answers as to what became of Richard, nor has he been located. How does a man drive out into the desert and vanish without a trace, and all these years later the answers continue to avoid detection? Either Richard truly became lost out there and has yet to be found, or someone holds the answers to this mystery but chooses not to reveal them. Unfortunately, without more information, finding Richard himself or someone coming forward, the vanishing of Richard Bendel will remain open, unsolved, and very cold. If you're looking for more information about the vanishing of Richard Bendel, there are some articles available and forum posts about his case, but information is fairly thin. The most reliable sources for this episode were both the Twin Falls Times News and the South Idaho Press. There is also a Facebook page which is maintained by members of his family. You can find the page by searching for Rick Bendel on Facebook. I'll also provide a link in the show notes. If you have any information about the vanishing of Richard Bendel, please contact the Blaine County Sheriff's Office at 208-788-5555. He is case number 96-11000033. What do you believe happened? Tweet me at TraceEvPod.com. Email me at traceevidencepod at gmail.com or comment in the Facebook group. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to thank our very amazing Patreon producers. Thank you to Alicia Townsend, Amy Guthrie, Andrew Guarino, Anne Bertram, Brittany Bivens, Christine Greco, Denise Dingsdale, Donna Butram, Diane Dyson, Eamon Brady, Eloanne Meyer, Fabulous TT, Greg, Guillerme Pinto, Haley Christie, James, Jennifer Winkler, Jill Sense, Joni Berkwitz, Julie Mangano, Kara Moreland, Lars Jensen Fengel, Leslie B, Marla Wright, Melissa Breckeisen, Nick Mohar Schurz, Quinn McBreen, Sarah Lyons, Susie the Cutie, Travis Skepko, Stacy Finnegan, Stephanie Joyner, Stephanie Eve, Tiffany Nelson, Tom Archer, and Tom Radford. Thank you so much for your amazing support. Without you, this show would not be possible. If you're interested in learning more about this case or other cases featured on the show, please visit trace-evidence.com. There you can find case breakdowns, all social media links, merchandise shops, case descriptions, media, 
and options for donating, including PayPal and Patreon, should you wish to support the show. That concludes this week's coverage of the mysterious vanishing of Richard Bendel. Once again, I want to thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me next week for another unsolved case on the next episode of Trace Evidence.